hello, Kelly. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Um, from your experience investing in and otherwise supporting women entrepreneurs in the West, are there any differences in the kind of support they need? And has this required you and your team to deviate from standard investor support here? I think the same support for women entrepreneurs here as we do in the West. Um, it's always about bringing, we say, entrepreneurs who are outside the traditional power structures and ecosystem into it and really opening doors. Um, opening doors to investment, opening doors to other investors, using the credibility of like, women like me um, or other investors who are investing in women, using our credibility and reputation to get those entrepreneurs in front of other investors or corporates or whoever else can help their um, venture move forward. Uh, building on that, um, from your experience in the region, how best can investors go about supporting existing women entrepreneurs here? Um, and then about opening doors, what can they do to encourage women who aren't entrepreneurs to take that leap? I think, I mean, let's go with the second question first in terms of getting other sure. women entrepreneurs to, to, or other women to take that leap into entrepreneurship. Yeah. I think it's really important that we show role models. And with the conversation around women in entrepreneurship or women in tech, so much of it is negative. It's how hard it is, the hurdles. I mean, if you were going to go to any career and you heard, or you were going to pursue any opportunity and you just heard how awful it was, I mean, you wouldn't do it, right? Yeah. So to actually highlight, you want to encourage women in entrepreneurship, highlight women who are making it. It doesn't mean candy coating it, it doesn't mean you know trying to pretend that it's not difficult, but highlight their achievements um, and highlight their success and that would encourage other women to pursue it. I also think in terms of helping women who are existing entrepreneurs, giving them the publicity and, and profiling them as they need it and about what they're doing. Like, how can we help them sell more products, you know, get their services, you know, into more companies? Um, not that I don't think it's important to highlight who they are as human beings, but let's focus on them as entrepreneurs and as business leaders. How can we get more business? And I think for any uh, investors who are investing in women entrepreneurs or want to help them, ask them what they need with their business and then follow up on it. Okay, so not necessarily focus on the fact that they're women, focus right. on their achievements just as entrepreneurs. Right, right. Sure. That's great. Real simple. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, uh, based on your experience with mentorship and acceleration in New York, what strategies or methods do you think would most successfully transfer you to the region? Um, I'm a big fan of accelerators and, and incubators. Um, you know, primarily for the reason is that you're you're bringing entrepreneurs who may otherwise be outside of um, the structures uh, in terms of getting feedback, getting mentors who have got industry experience and walked those shoes before. Um, I think for any entrepreneur, I would really encourage them to investigate uh, and, and do the due diligence on the accelerator or the incubator as much as they're doing it on the entrepreneur in terms of accepting them into the program. So it's a two-way street. Absolutely a two-way street. And to be really clear as an entrepreneur why you're doing something, right? Why are you, why do you think your company could benefit from an accelerator or an incubator? Not just it's the thing to do, but being very clear and goal-focused on why you want to succeed in it and then go after it. One of the biggest things with accelerators and incubators is this mentorship, the access, the feedback. And you know what? Take advantage of it. And don't wait until the program is over to take advantage of it, but do that from day one. Absolutely. And then what about any specific strategies you use within the accelerator um, that you think maybe wouldn't transfer so successfully to the um, region? I would be much more flexible on the length of the program. Um, I think if startups need to be at a certain tipping point funding-wise. Um, for a four-month program, which is very typical uh, in North America, uh, and a four-month program that leads to a demo day, which is a pitch to investors. I think that can sometimes lead startups down the wrong path and the wrong expectation. Uh, I think there's a lot of, of startups who need that structure and that opportunity to be given resources that they wouldn't otherwise have access to, mentors they wouldn't otherwise have access to, feedback in a structured environment that en enables them to accelerate right, their development faster, but it doesn't necessarily, like, focus it on, on building a great company, not necessarily 
just finessing a pitch for a demo day, which is in most cases an artificial construct anyways. I even think sometimes, you know, that four-month program, like I said, it's, it's a, in some ways you're forcing startups into a program versus saying, is this the right way to structure the program for the startups? Absolutely. And, and so I think, you know, if you go, cut it back to its bare bones, what it's supposed to be, to say, all right, how can we help the startups? What do they need? What do they need at this stage? And what should be, you know, sort of the the milestone or end goal that we're getting them to, you know, achieve in this, you know, limited period of time, you know, and how do we motivate them to do that? You know, for a lot of these programs, the motivation is a demo day in front of investors, right? So I think there is something about that compressed period of time. I don't know if four months is the right answer, right? And I also don't know if, if this... As I said, this artificial construct is going towards a demo day. And part of the reason I say that is, at the end of the day, in the United States, for startups that can actually get in front of a VC or an angel, or an angel group, and actually have the opportunity to pitch and get a meeting, only so that, you know, we've already, like, narrowed that funnel of startups, right? The number that actually gets funded is between three and five percent, right? So one of the one of the best examples of this was um, Andreessen Horowitz. They listed out. They said from several thousand applications, and they only take applications from their network. So they only take in maybe three or four thousand inbound deals, right? So they've already got gates there that limit it to three or four thousand. They take several hundred seriously. So what? They're down to two or three hundred. They invest in twenty. Period. So I think some of this hype around a pitch to investors is the wrong focus. Okay. Right? Build a great company. Sure. And, and, fo and focus the accelerators okay. that way versus you have to build it based on investment. Therefore, let's get you polished up for a demo day. When the reality is you're not likely to get funding. The likelihood is you could build a good company. So moving on to um, networks and that's questions. Um, what is the role of networks in creating strong, diverse ecosystems, and how can we help create the networks? Right. Um, that's a great question. That's a great question for here, building you know the ecosystem uh, in the Arab world. Um, for anyone, whether you're a startup or an individual, opportunities come from networks, and you never know where your next opportunity, your sale, your your CTO, your first hire, and, and you don't want everything coming from the same per perspective or the same network, so wider networks in terms of creating opportunities. Uh, and I particularly find that for startups. I mean, you, you, you need to let your existing network know what you're doing so you can grow from it. And you know, a particular example for, for early stage companies, a lot of them look to crowdfunding. And there's this notion with crowdfunding that stranger, you know, you put a nice video and a pretty page up on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or whichever site you're using, and then strangers throw money at you. The reality is you're going to achieve your Kickstarter or Indiegogo, whatever crowdfunding campaign, if your own network actually gets you there. And then the money from strangers who are, you know, have FOMO because they're going to miss out on the next Pebble Watch or whatever it may be kicks in. But they need to, your own network needs to know what you're doing and, and needs to build on that. And when I think of an ecosystem... What are all the various pieces that need to come into place to help the entrepreneurs? And I think when you think of a network and you think, you know, we're standing here in Bay Ridge, you know, what they can do for the entrepreneurs, that should be the first question with the ecosystem. The center of it should be the entrepreneurs, and then how are all the different, you know, pieces around that? Government, academia, existing business community, um, you know, I'm going to say students who are looking for jobs, like all of that is then the network of how they come into play to help entrepreneurs so we can really grow this entrepreneurial community in, in uh, Lebanon and Beirut and the world. How can teams internally use social media to facilitate more social communication and a stronger culture? That's, I mean, I was really intrigued that you wanted to ask that question and then thinking about it. Um, one of the things I don't think teams do enough of is, is think about how each individual is holding themselves out in the world as being part of a company. And the brand of a company is made up as not just their own mission statement, what they say they are, but how every individual employee 
So one of the first things I think any company, whether it's a big company or small company, should do is sit down with employees and talk about how they want them to hold themselves up. And what I think that builds a stronger team culture because everyone is understanding what the company's brand is, what the corporate brand is, how they feel about how they interact and communicate, and then how they want the team as a representative of the company to hold themselves out in the world. And that may be as simple as, what's your description on social media of who your employer is? How they want you to have that on LinkedIn, right? Um, how they want you to identify yourself because you're tweeting and maybe the company isn't. But I think to understand, I mean, for me, so much of social media is it's the personality of a company, it's their culture, it's their mission, it's their engagement with consumers. And I think for employees, team to understand, you know, how the company is doing that on social media it goes further back and who, what's the DNA of the company. Sure, which in itself builds the culture. Exactly. Exactly. So by coaching the team on how to how to outwardly present, it's, it's building more of a bond within the team. And building the bond and, and everyone's understanding what their responsibility right. is. Everyone's understanding what the culture of the company is. Right. Yeah. And there's, it's, it's almost um, using social media as a way to do that onboarding and continue that HR conversation when you bring on someone new or that CEO's message that comes out in a shareholder report. It's a way of really saying, here's who we are and what we stand for, and you are part of that. Um, so really attaching yourself you know, to it more deeply. And then from you know, the company perspective, you don't have one person you know, tweeting on your behalf. You have an army. Right. And what better brand engagement than that? Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Hope you're enjoying the day. I am. Great.